Okay, uh, what we want to talk about now is uh, we're going to go into a use of kinetic theory uh, in plasmas. And the basic idea is, uh, well, we're still talking about kinetic theory. And what we want to do is derive, using kinetic theory, uh, our standard electron plasma oscillations. And the feature, and what we will be attempting to do is not just derive the electron plasma oscillations, but also so-called collisionless or Landau damping. So let's say uh, electron plasma oscillations plus collisionless. And we'll talk then about how that comes about, or Landau damping. Now, uh, basically, what we're going to do is the same thing we used to do in all the fluid business. You set up a set of equations, you linearize them, you take waves e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, and, uh, and you find a dispersion relation, then you look at the wave frequencies and so forth and so on. Uh, but we'll now do it uh, kinetically. So first, let's remember what kind of a model we need for this. The first is that we say, well, there's, for simplicity, there's no electric or magnetic field in equilibrium. We'll make the distribution function be infinite and homogeneous and steady state, but have some velocity dependence. And for example, it could be a Maxwellian, but we won't necessarily assume that right off at the first. Uh, we will, however, later. The second sort of set of assumptions is that we'll assume that we have kinetic electrons. So we'll have to solve for them out of a kinetic equation. Um, but we'll also have just an immobile ions, um, you know, a charge neutralizing ion background, which we usually have and so forth. And we will also assume that we have, for simplicity, electrostatics. Usually, if the plasma pressure is low enough or beta, that's the case. And therefore, E is equal to minus grad phi. Again, we could do better, but um, it's sufficient to do the electrostatics. So the idea is, you remember, the first stage of our, well, uh, let me write down our plasma kinetic equation then, I guess is the next thing I ought to write down. So plasma kinetic equation. And here we're interested in the collision less limit. So the one we're interested in is the so-called Flazov equation. And that is just partial of f with respect to t plus v dot partial of f with respect to x plus q over m e. And then usually we have plus v cross b dot df dv is equal to zero, but uh, we're going to be perfectly uh, satisfied with taking away the magnetic field, so we'll just take away that term. Now, we need to linearize. And what we need to do to linearize is to realize that the distribution function, which is a function of x, v, and t, three spatial coordinates, um, three configuration space coordinates, three velocity space coordinates, and time. We need to have it's equal to its equilibrium value plus some small perturbation. So we have the equilibrium value is infinite homogeneous. So it says don't depend upon spatial, three spatial coordinates x. And equilibrium, so don't depend upon time. But it could depend upon some arbitrary velocity distribution. Maxwellian, delta function, whatever we want. And then um, we have then a small perturbation away from that. And lacking any specific knowledge, we allow it to have dependences on uh, you know, x, v, and t. Now, the only other thing in this equation is likewise that we have e is equal to e naught plus e tilde. But we have an equilibrium where we've postulated that we've postulated such that there is no equilibrium electric field dependence. So if we substitute all this in, 
what we get then for the linearization procedure is just df dt. What about little v? Well, that's a spatial coordinate now. You, you know, it's a particular velocity space coordinate. It's not something we perturb, right? So then df tilde by dx plus q and m are constants, so q over m. Now we will have an e tilde dot df naught by dv. And then we would have a q over m. There's no e naught, so we don't have that term. But I would have also an e tilde dot df tilde by dx. And that's equal to 0. But this is, of course, a nonlinear term. And so we set that equal to 0 uh, by saying we're only interested in linearized analysis. Now, our next stage in the process of working out um, you know, waves in plasmas, whether it's in fluid or kinetic, is, of course, to assume that we have e to the i k dot x minus i omega t uh, wave-like phenomena. So let's take our kinetic equation then and uh, assume wave-like phenomena which is to say that f tilde and uh, e tilde go like uh, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. And if we do that in our equation, remember partial with respect to t just goes to minus i omega, and d by dx goes to i k vector. So putting that in, we get minus i omega f tilde plus i k dot v f tilde. And now I'm, this is kind of a source term, so I'm going to stick it on the right-hand side. So it becomes minus q over m e tilde dot df naught by dv. But e tilde, you remember, was equal to minus grad phi, which always goes to minus i k vector phi tilde. And putting this together, we can write this as minus i omega minus k dot v, f tilde, which is to say it's just the Doppler shifted frequency by k dot v, the particular region in velocity space or particular group of particles we're interested in treating. So putting all this together, this minus sign goes with that one, so we'll make it uh, plus. Um, and then uh, putting in the electric field, you see that the distribu perturbed distribution function uh, is going to be equal to minus q over m phi tilde k dot df naught by dv divided by omega minus k dot v. And we said that we were going to do all this kinetics for electrons because they're the responsive species. Uh, ions are immobile, background, no big deal. So we want to specialize then for electrons. And for electrons, we know that Q over M becomes minus E over M sub E. And so because of that, then we can have F E tilde is equal to plus E over M sub E phi tilde times uh, K dot DF naught electron by DV divided by omega minus K dot V. And again, because K, V, and omega are all properties of either the wave or the coordinate system, they do not depend upon, you know, whether we're talking about electrons or ions. Now, already maybe you should be asking some questions because I kind of divided by zero, right? At least I divided by the possibility of zero. Whenever I have waves with omega over k equal to the local velocity in that region of velocity space, then all those particles are going to see some form of a singular interaction or resonant interaction. But for the moment, we just go blazing ahead is the best way I can say this. 
and, and we'll come back and worry about that point in a moment. But uh, let's just say at this moment, note uh, singularity at omega equals k dot v, or alternatively, omega over k equals uh, v. Um, actually, it's v dot k hat, turns out, but anyway. So we'll just kind of keep that in mind and kind of go blazing along for a moment. Okay, what do we do with the perturbed distribution function? Well, what we need to do with it is calculate the perturbed charge density it causes and put that into Poisson's equation or Gauss's law, however we want to do it. So let's, uh, so let's first calculate the perturbed density. caused by this perturbed potential and or perturbed electric field. And that, the electron perturbed density, would just be the integral over all velocity space of the electron distribution function. And just sticking in, then, what we just obtained, this will be... Um, See, I don't want to do this. Yeah, just E over M sub E integral d cubed V. Uh, the phi tilde can also come out because it doesn't depend upon um, the velocity space integral. But then we have k dot df naught E by dV divided by omega minus k dot V. Um, now, it's uh, convenient, let me just say it that way, to use this other definition that F naught E hat is equal to F naught um, E of V, the velocity distribution, but divide by the density. And if we do this, then the integral dQ V of F naught E hat of V will be 1 instead of the density. Okay? So... That's convenient. If we do that, then our NE tilde becomes equal to N naught E, E over M sub E phi tilde integral dQ V K dot D F naught E hat normalized by dV and then divided by omega minus uh, K dot V. Now, why did we want the electron density? Well, we wanted to stick it in Poisson's equation and get a dispersion relation, okay, or Gauss's law. So let's do Gauss's law goes to Poisson's equation, basically to be able to calculate the electric field. The idea is we start out with del dot E is equal to rho over epsilon naught, rho being the charge density, then we use the electric field, E is equal to minus gradient phi. This becomes minus del squared phi tilde is equal to rho tilde over epsilon naught. I could have put the tildes back here. And then we assume everything's e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. Um, del squared is equal to del dot del, and that's equal to i k goes to ik dot ik, and so that's equal to minus k squared. And so putting all this together, we get plus k squared phi tilde is equal to rho tilde over epsilon naught, and that'll be just e over epsilon naught, and i tilde minus n e tilde. But we said we were going to have immobile ions. Uh, so we'll throw away the perturbed ion response. And then we just stick all of this perturbed electron response in. And you can see that what we will get out of it is n naught e, e squared over m sub e epsilon naught plasma frequency, which is nice to see a familiar quantity, even coming out of more complicated things. Uh, 
and then integral dq v k dot df naught hat e by dv all divided by omega minus k dot v. And again, that is the plasma frequency squared. So let's mark that down. Uh, and I missed out on a minus sign there, okay, because I had a minus in tilde. Um, so what we end up with then, just to, to sort of summarize all this, is we get k squared phi tilde is equal to minus omega p e squared times phi tilde and the integral overall velocity space of k dot df naught hat e by dv divided by omega minus k dot v. Okay, now I certainly have this um, singularity here, but at least it's buried inside an integral, and I can hope that something happens to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, simplify it, um, um, you know, resolve the singularity. Maybe it's an integrable singularity, something like that. Um, that's going to turn out to be quite important, as we'll see. But we'll get there in a moment. Okay, now let's simplify a little further. Uh, Let's assume that we choose a coordinate system. By the way, how should we choose a coordinate system in this case? Is there anything determining the coordinate system? Not really, except for the direction of the k-vector. Okay, So let's just choose the k-vector will be in the direction of x-hat. We don't have any magnetic field. We don't have any flows. We don't have any you know that sort of stuff. Um, if we do that, then k dot v will become k vx. Okay. What about uh, k dot df naught hat e by dv? Well, this again will be this will be k x hat dot, and then we'd have x hat df naught e by d vx uh, plus y hat. These are all not going to be any, or not going to count, but I'll write them down anyway. By dvy plus z hat partial of f naught e with respect to vz, and these of course all vanish, but the first term counts, so I just get k df naught e hat with respect to vx. So what that means is if I look back at my dispersion relation up here, I can write it as, um, by the way, I could have canceled out, come to think about it, the phi. So let's just take that out there. Get tired of writing it. So we get k squared is equal to minus omega p e squared. And then this becomes the integral over all velocity space of k df naught e hat by dvx divided by omega minus k vx. Now, so that's what my dispersion relation has come down to. Now, how about this form? Well, um, this integral over velocity space is over three coordinates, x, y, and z, but most of the interesting action seems to all be in the x direction. So at this point, it's convenient to define an, a, a sort of subsidiary or projected distribution function, namely f of vx is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity dvy, the integral minus infinity to infinity dvz of this f hat naught, f naught hat electrons uh, of v. Um, this projected averaged or average distribution averaged over the y and z directions, over the directions other than the direction the wave is traveling, is still still has unity normalization, minus infinity to infinity d uh, vx, uh, f of vx is still equal to 1. 
um, just by our choice of everything here. Um, if we do that, then this integral dqv, I can take, I can perform these two integrations directly inside and just get the capital F distribution, but I'm still left with the other part. <clears throat> and then notice that I've got a k here, and I'd like to divide through by a k, and then this will be omega over k minus vx, and I'll just switch signs. So the net result of all that, and I'll divide through by k squared, is that then what we end up with is 1 is equal to omega pe squared over k squared, and then the integral from minus infinity to infinity of dvx um, times df, which is only a function now of vx, dx, dvx, sorry, divided by vx minus omega over k. And we can also, if we, well, the way people usually write this, it turns out, is, is just they write that vx goes to a variable u, um, just some speed, and then they write it as omega pe squared over k squared, integral minus infinity to infinity, du, um, df du, divided by u minus omega over k. So this is our dispersion relation for plasma waves in a plasma with a kinetic um, uh, distribution function. Now, if you remember, what we got for electron plasma oscillations was basically just that omega squared is equal to omega pe squared. This kind of doesn't look like that yet, so we've got a little work to do. How about if I tried to perform that integral? Well, you might ask, if I do, what do I do with that singularity? Okay. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about that singularity. So let's just kind of look at it here. So let's imagine we were performing this last integration. Um, if we plot the integrand here, uh, as a function of uh, u, I guess, and I want, uh, let's call it f prime over u minus omega over k, then often f prime is less than zero, so I'll have to take that into account, I guess. And what we have is there's some particular value, omega over k here, at which we have a singularity. And it's an odd singularity, that is to say, um, u greater than omega over k, it would be a positive function, except that f prime is usually negative. So I should say for f prime less than zero. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so then taking account of that, turns out I'll end up with a singularity that looks like this, and another singularity that looks like that. So. How could I do that integral? Well, it turns out one way you could do it, and, and we'll come back to this in a moment, is you can do what's called a principal value integral. The idea is that you know that if I perform carefully such an integral, and I integrate, okay, little patches here, okay, right there, and a little patch right there, that roughly speaking, as these patches go to the singular point, this positive infinity one cancels off with that negative infinity one, right? And so mathematically, the way in which people define that is they define the principal value integral of the integral minus infinity du of df du divided by u minus omega over k. They make it as the limit as epsilon goes to zero, where epsilon will be the distance I'll come off of that, of the integral from minus infinity, okay, way over here to the left, up to this particular point, which is then omega over k minus epsilon. And then this is, you know, du f prime over u minus omega over k. Um, 
And then, in addition, I have to have the integral going from here on up to infinity. So the first one was the integral up to there, and then I'm going to shrink that distance down. And so the other one goes from omega over k plus epsilon to infinity du f prime u minus omega over k. So this is one way of defining such an integral. This is the so-called principal value. But is it the right way? Well, it turns out that Flasov, uh, for which we named the collisionless kinetic equation, Flasov did such an analysis like we've just done to get this dispersion relation. And he did this principal value integral. And if you do that, you can see that, that I'm only going to get real quantities. Okay. But Landau came along and he said, well, uh, if you really look at what's going on with an initial value problem, doing a proper Laplace transform, not just assuming waves in a plasma, uh, in fact, there's an additional contribution. And when you really define the, the integral you had properly, and we'll go through how we define that, that you actually get an additional term beyond this term, which is an imaginary part, and that gives you, uh, uh, you know, some sort of damping, uh, which is called Landau damping. So that's what we want to go through now, is go through the initial value analysis, which extends or makes more precise the usual uh, wave-like analysis. And uh, we'll come back and find that we need to specify this principal value integral again. So the basic idea, then, uh, is we need to do what's called an initial value problem. And this was originally worked out by Landau, a uh, Russian physicist in the um, uh, 30s, 36 or so. And it was how to handle this singularity was basically the question. The way we do this is by Laplace transformation. Now, we're still perfectly happy with um, doing e to the i k dot x. Okay, because we've got an infinite homogeneous medium, and we're perfectly happy to just assume we have e to the i k dot x modes. That's, that's not any real problem. Uh, on the other hand, time has an initial value sense to it, and that's what we need to uh, work at in detail. So what we're going to do is Latrosse transform in time, but uh, e to the i k dot x uh, uh, as you as before, so we will not likewise Fourier transform in space, but rather we'll just assume the waves are e to the i k dot x. Now, what does the Laplace transform look like? Well, it turns out in plasma physics we use it in a form that most people don't use it in, so it's a little bit we have to define it. Namely, we like to you remember this e to the minus i omega t, but a lot of the standard Laplace transform literature is written a little differently, namely e to the pt and e to the st. Depends on which books you get on that sort of thing. But what we will define is we'll define a transform of some function f of omega as the Laplace transform operator, which I'll write as a script L, on f of t. And it will be defined as the integral from 0 to infinity dt. Uh, of e to the i omega t f of t. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, it, does that integral converge? I mean, now I get into a few little mathematical properties. I have to kind of make sure of things. Well, it will converge as long as imaginary omega is greater than some constant, which I'll denote by sigma, where sigma is such that the limit as t goes to infinity, of e to the minus sigma t, which is what I get if imaginary omega, put imaginary omega in there, of f of t uh, is equal to zero, or goes to zero. So the idea as, is that as long as f of t is not growing too rapidly in time, exponentially, then 
I can always find a sigma that it's not growing that rapidly as t goes to infinity, and this integral is a well is a well defined integral um, because uh, for that. Now, the thing that's a little bit different is if you go into uh, typically electrical engineering literature or uh, many other Laplace transform literatures, people will use not e to the i omega t, but usually, but they'll use e to the minus s t or e to the minus p t. And then the Laplace transform variable becomes s or p, and that is the imaginary part of omega, you see. Or it's p is equal to i omega is what it amounts to, or minus i omega. So, uh, but we, you might remember, got hooked on e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, and got hooked on, we used a lot, okay? And so we find it convenient to, to use it in this form. Now, so, you know, the usual procedure in Laplace transforms is you take the Laplace transform in the equation, you then solve for the, um, the function, the Laplace transform of the function, and then you perform the inverse integration, right? So let's, what we want to do is basically the same thing, but now we're going to maybe need to define also an inverse Laplace transform. And that will be f of t, some function, will be the inverse Laplace transform of this f hat of omega. And that will be defined as the integral from minus infinity to infinity, but it's actually along a contour uh, in the complex omega plane, which is infinity plus i sigma, uh, and then it's uh, minus infinity plus i sigma to infinity plus i sigma, and I'll sketch it here in a moment, uh, d omega over 2 pi, and then e to the minus i omega t uh, f hat of omega. Um, now I need to kind of uh, sketch the contour that goes along with this. So if I look in the complex omega plane, this is um, the real part of omega, and this is the imaginary part of omega, and our contour is some, or our integration contour here, is along some line which is a distance sigma above the real line. And now we're definitely into complex variables, it turns out. And so some people, since this is a minus infinity plus i sigma to, sorry, plus infinity plus i sigma, some people just call this a Laplace contour, uh, in which case they just write this as the integral along a Laplace contour, t omega over 2 pi. Uh, e to the minus i omega t times f hat of omega. Okay, so this is our basically just Laplace transformation definition. And so the next step is we want to go back to our kinetic equation and take its Laplace transform. Okay? So what was our kinetic equation? Uh, so let's say Laplace transform the kinetic equation, or linearized kinetic equation, the linearized kinetic equation. At first, that, let's remind ourselves what that equation was. It was partial of f tilde with respect to t plus v, no tilde, v dot df tilde by dx is equal to uh, minus q over m uh, e tilde dot df tilde by dv, and this on the right-hand side could have been written as plus q over m gradient of phi tilde using electrostatics dot df naught by dv. Now, the first thing is we want to assume that f tilde and e tilde still have an e to the i k dot x dependence. But we're now not going to assume they have the minus i omega t dependence. So if we assume that, 
So let's assume. Um, then what happens is that our kinetic equation becomes partial of F tilde with respect to T. Um, let's see. Plus I K dot V F tilde. And this is equal to, and now it's uh, I Q over M K phi tilde dot the F naught by dV. And this is the equation, then, that we want to Fourier transform. Or, I'm sorry, Laplace transform. And how do we do that? Well, let's take Laplace transform of F tilde. By the way, what are the arguments of F tilde here? Well, because I took out an e to the i k dot x, x has to changed into k. There's a k dependence, basically. Uh, I still have the v dependence because I'm at a particular position in velocity space. And I have time. But the Laplace transform of that, just by the definitions we did on the previous slide, would just become f hat of k, v, and omega. And similarly, the Laplace transform of phi, which now is a function of k and t, becomes phi hat. Hat means I've transformed, basically, of k and omega. Now what do we do? Well, that takes care of this term, this term. What about that term? Well, I have to do a little work. You know, I can't get by with everything being trivial. So we have to take the Laplace transform partial of f with respect to t. And let's just, again, write out what the Laplace transform is then. It's the integral from 0 to infinity, dt, e to the i omega t, and then just partial of f tilde with respect to t. What can I do about that? Well, uh, I can integrate by parts, basically. And so, you know, you just put this together with this and then uh, make that just df. And doing so, then this just becomes e to the i omega t times f tilde uh, from t equals 0 to infinity. And then we subtract the integral from 0 to infinity of uh, dt uh, f uh, tilde and then d by dt of e to the i omega t. Now, so first thing we've got here is we've got to evaluate this in the limit that t goes to infinity, e to the i omega t f tilde. What do we do about that? e to the i omega infinity. Well, we remember, this is where our definition becomes important, that we had that the imaginary part of omega was greater than some specific value sigma, right? So what that means is I'll have e to the i omega real times t goes to infinity, and that'll oscillate forever. But I also have minus omega i times infinity, and this is all times f tilde at infinity. But because of, as I should think of this as the limit as t goes to infinity. But anyway, uh, that's exponentially damp, so we won't have to worry about that whole term. How about at t equals 0? Well, we just get f hat, f tilde, sorry, of k, v, and t equals 0. So that took care of the two limits of that uh, evaluation. What about the last part? Well, this is just i omega e to the i omega t. And so this just becomes minus i omega integral from 0 to infinity dt e to the i omega t times f tilde. And what is that? Well, it's just what we defined as the Laplace transform. So in other words, this is f hat of omega or f hat of kv and omega, let's put it that way. So 
what we have found, let me just sort of summarize this last little part here, uh, is that the Laplace transform of partial of F tilde with respect to T is equal to minus the initial condition, F tilde of KV and T equals zero, and then minus I omega times the Fourier transform, I'm sorry, the Laplace transform F hat of KV and omega. Okay, now I can use all of these back in my um, Fourier transform, I'm sorry, in, in, in my linearized Lazov equation to just take the various moments of those equation of, of those terms, and, and the Laplace transform of those various terms. So what we get is, okay, just filling in the first one, we get minus the initial condition, F tilde of K, V, and T equals zero. And then we get minus I omega F hat of K, V, and omega. Um, and I guess we actually want to use the um, e to the i k dot x form. So then we get plus i k dot v f hat, again, of k, v, and omega. And then this is all equal to i q over m phi tilde actually becomes phi hat now because I Fourier transform. And then k dot df naught by dv. And now I kind of need to remember all the time I'm going along that this was all derived in the limit that omega, the imaginary part of omega, was greater than some positive constant sigma. So that the perturbation f of t was not growing faster than e to the sigma t, growing, growing slower, slower than that. Okay, now again, this is sort of an initial condition, and this is a inhomogeneous term, and these two terms are the homogeneous terms. So let's sort of collect terms here. So we get minus i omega minus k dot v times f hat of k v and omega. That's omega went in there, k dot v went in there. And um, then this is equal to, now first there's this initial condition, F tilde of K, V, and T equals zero. And then there's this other term, let's just say. And that other term is this thing right here. So let's see if we can get it on here all right. Um, so this becomes plus I uh, Q over M phi hat K dot DF naught DV. Um, now we can, again, solve for the perturbed distribution function then, at least its Laplace transform, which is that f hat of k, v, and omega becomes equal to uh, f tilde of k, v, and t equals zero, the initial condition divided by minus i, omega minus k dot v. And then we have this other term, uh, which when I divide through, you see just becomes a minus. The i's cancel out. And it becomes q over m uh, phi hat uh, k dot df naught by dv uh, divided by omega minus k dot v. Now, what are these two, by the way, the, um, sorry, this part right here, since for electrons, Q is minus E, so this just becomes plus E over M sub E for electrons. And we're only interested in electrons, it turns out. Um, this is kind of interesting, so to speak. What does this first term say? Which every term should tell you something physically, okay? So what does this first term tell us? Well, it says take the initial condition and do something to it 
which in Fourier Laplace transform space actually means propagate it at the speed v. So it's a ballistic propagation of the initial response, it turns out. So we just call this the ballistic or, you know, just straightforward inertial motion. Ballistic propagation propagation of the initial conditions or initial perturbation um, forward in time uh, with or via the what's what would be called the linear propagator, one over omega minus k dot one over i k omega minus k dot v. So the linear propagator. You can have nonlinear propagators and more and fancier stuff. But anyway, if you remember when you work backwards on all this, um, when we did some wave studies before, if we had this sort of pop propagator, it caused x to become not just x, but x plus vt in the uh, uh, solutions. What does this second term give us? Well, this is a perturbation in the uh, distribution function of the plasma caused by the fact that I have a potential or an electric field in the plasma. So this is the collective plasma response. And because it's due to the electric field, it actually leads to the plasma polarization. So this is the collective plasma response and what it does is lead to uh, the polarization of the plasma. Okay, now, so this is the perturbed distribution function. What do we do with that? We want to calculate the perturbed density from it by integrating over all velocity space. And then we want to stick it into uh, Poisson's equation. So basically, we want that n e tilde, or n e hat actually, is equal to the integral dq v of f e hat of k v and omega. Um, and remember that we, we want to then use that in, I won't work that out for the moment. Uh, we wanted to use this in Poisson's equation, or Gauss's law, Poisson's equation, which we had was del dot E uh, is equal to rho over epsilon naught. We took its perturbation, and then we used E equals minus grad phi. Uh, and so this just became minus del squared phi tilde is equal to rho tilde over epsilon naught. Uh, and then the minus del squared became k squared. And the rho tilde we wrote as e over epsilon naught ni tilde minus ne tilde. And the ni tilde we threw away because we have immobile ions. And so all in all, we end up with k squared phi tilde is equal to e minus e over epsilon naught uh, times n e tilde, which is then what we wanted up here. And we take its Fourier Laplace transform, and, and or Laplace transform. And to, I say, keep saying Fourier Laplace because when you do more complicated kinetic theory, what you really end up doing is, is in addition, uh, doing that, uh, uh, doing both the Fourier the Laplace transform in time and the Fourier transform in space. But we won't need that here. So anyway, uh, you do this as the integral over all velocity space of this k, v, and omega. OK. Now, uh, so if we just put in now the f which we obtained before and just you know stick this f into there and work it out, you can see that the first term is going to give us uh, plus the integral dq v of f hat, or f tilde, the initial condition, k, v, and t equals 0, divided by i omega minus k dot v. And again, that's just propagation along with the 
um, well, as regular. And then in addition to this, uh, then uh, this is just the ballistic response of the initial condition. And then this last term is, of course, our plasma polarization type term. And we get minus, mi uh, minus well, sorry, we get an overall minus. And uh, uh, I guess I need to, you know, normalize the, the equilibrium distribution function um, just like we did before, let's just say. So I get N naught E, E squared over M sub E epsilon naught. Uh, and then this is times the integral over all velocity space. Uh, and I just needed to put, sorry, a phi tilde out there. And then it's k dot df naught hat e by dv, all divided by omega minus k dot v. Now, this has two terms times phi. The k squared represents the vacuum, and the rest of this represents the plasma response. So it turns out, let me say just you work all this through, you can sort of see that I will get that phi hat um, of k and omega, which is the Laplace transform of what I'd like to know, is then equal to, uh, there's this first term, which uh, I can see I should have put in E over epsilon naught and had it normalized, so I should have had an N naught E in there. So there's an N naught E E over epsilon naught times the initial condition, integral dQ V F tilde of K V and T equals zero. So that's our initial condition now divided by I omega minus k dot v. And then it gets divided by something, which is like k squared. And it would be an epsilon naught, but what I'm going to do is define it as an epsilon hat of k and omega, where that's our dielectric constant. And then I want to write that out on the next sheet for you. Namely, that our dielectric constant has become e to the k omega, or epsilon hat k omega is equal to epsilon naught, one, and that's the vacuum response. And then we have minus omega pe squared over k squared, because this is, again, omega pe squared. Um, and then the integral dq v k dot df naught e hat by dv all divided by omega minus k dot v. Or pulling all the same tricks we did before about d-dimensionalizing things and projecting it into one direction and so forth, this becomes 1 minus omega pe squared over k squared integral du from minus infinity to infinity times uh, df du divided by u minus omega over k. Actually, that one should have been a plus, I can see. Now, this then is exactly the same as we got before, with only, uh, that is to say, for our dielectric constant set equal to zero to get the normal modes. So exactly what we had is before, with only one exception. And that is that we now know that we should define this only for imaginary omega greater than sigma. So what we'll do is break here for a moment, and then we'll come back and try to undo uh, these types of, you, you know, we'll try to analyze what happens when I take account of this constraint that imaginary omega has to be greater than sigma, and I will have to analytically continue my results downward to where I'm interested in.